Everyone's coming in. Mm -hmm. There you go. Hello. Hello. What do I do? You're right there. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Goodfellow. I'm the Director of Public Art at the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. And in that capacity, I am the Director of the Boston Art Commission. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the October meeting and just ask you to take a quick peek on some of the notes we have over there on the right. If you have a chance to, please remember to update your name and your Zoom profile and add your pronouns. And you have the ability to mute and unmute yourself during this meeting, so please keep yourself muted um, so that we don't hear all different kinds of background noise as we're speaking. And when it is time for public testimony, the chair and vice chair will invite you. Um, and so welcome and thank you for being here today. As background, the Boston Art Commission, if we could go a couple slides. Um, the Boston Art Commission is staffed by the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. It is an independent board composed of two ex officio and seven appointed volunteer art and design professionals that holds public meetings to review and vote on matters concerning the city's art collection. Meetings are generally held the second Tuesday of each month to review current public art projects cited on or proposed for City Boston property in accordance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts executive order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are conducting this meeting virtually. To ensure public access to the deliberations of the Boston Art Commission, the public may access this meeting through telephone and video conferencing. I am joined by the Boston Art Commission staff, working within the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, Sarah Rodrigo, the Public Art Project Manager, and Trisha Gilrain, Collections Manager, who will be helping to facilitate this meeting. I will now hand it over to Chair Mark Pasnick and Vice Chair Aqua Holmes, who will be calling the meeting to order and going over some further instruction. Thank you, Karen, uh, and welcome to everybody. I'm calling this public hearing to order at 4.04 p.m. Today, the Boston Art Commission will be holding its monthly uh, public meeting for October. Uh, I will now take a roll call of the commissioners to confirm a quorum. After I state your name, commissioners, please say here. Um, Aqua Holmes. Maybe muted. Aqua Holmes. I apologize. I'm here. Okay. Uh, Camilo Alvarez. Here. Cara Elliott Ortega. Here. Brian Hone. Here. And, and welcome to Brian, a new member. Uh, Michael Canizzo. Here. Uh, Lisa Tung is not here. Robert Freeman. Here. And John Andres. Here. Okay, and welcome also to John, another new member. Our third new member, Kimberly, will be joining us, we hope, in a future meeting. Uh, so a quorum has been reached. Um, next up, the Commission and staff wish to provide some instruction on using this platform effectively to offer questions and comments from the public. Um, as you see in the slide above, uh, in front of you, uh, to briefly explain, uh, we will go over this procedure later on in the meeting when we have public commentary, but we just wanted to give you a, a brief. Um, as with regular BAC meetings, project partners and members of the public may have an opportunity to provide public testimony on items the commission will vote on. After presentations and commissioners clarifying questions, the chair, that's me, or Aqua Holmes, the vice chair, may invite public testimony. Please remember to keep your comments on topic and brief, and more, detail, more detailed instructions will be provided later in the meeting uh, when we get to the section where public commentary is happening. Uh, we'll be following the publicly posted agenda which you will see on the next slide. Um, this agenda uh, has been posted in advance of the meeting 
uh, and we'll begin with the director's report covering a number of topics as outlined uh, in this page. And we will move into presentations for review, public testimony, and items for vote. I want to update to this agenda the review and vote on the artist selection for the second long-term commission for the Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library has been postponed until November. We'll readdress that later. We will now review the meeting's minutes from the previous September 8th meeting of the Boston Art Commission. Are there any comments or modifications any commissioner would like to make at this time? No comments, okay. Uh, if there are no comments, could I have a motion to accept the minutes? I move we accept the minutes. Uh, so Robert Freeman, to accept the minutes. I'll second that. Okay, Oklahoma seconded it. All those in favor, I'll read your name and say yes. Uh, Aqua Holmes? Yes. Camilo Alvarez? Yes. Michael Canizzo? Yes. Cara Elliot Ortega? Yes. John Andres? Yes. Brian Hone? Yes. And Robert Freeman? Yes. Okay, so the, and I'm a yes as well, so the motion passes. We'll now have Karen Goodfeller give her director's report. Karen? Yes, thank you. Um, and before I get started on that, may I just ask, um, Shisha or Sarah, can you send the Zoom link to Kim? Yeah. I just got a message from her she needs it. Sorry, I'm not that great at multitasking. So um, with my director's report, um, we're gonna start with some administrative items. Um, the first is very exciting. Uh, the Boston City Council recently approved three nominations to the BAC. Um, John Andress, ICA, Brian Hone from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, and Dr. Kimberly Pinder from the Massachusetts College of Art and Design uh, were all approved by, by the City Council. And we're so thrilled to be having them join us. As, as Mark noted, both John and Brian are here with us today. And we look forward to having Kim with us officially um, after she's sworn in. With the City Council approval of uh, the three new commissioners, we must also say goodbye to Commissioner Fifield and Commissioner Tung. Commissioner Fifield will no longer be serving on the commission. Commissioner Tung will be replaced by Dr. Pinder, who has not yet been sworn in, as I mentioned, uh, by the city clerk. Uh, when Dr. Pinder is sworn in, Commissioner Tung will step down. And we really do want to thank both Lisa and George for the years of service on the commission. And we look forward to the expertise of the commis commissioners Hone and Andres and soon Dr. Pinder. But mostly we, we do right now just really wanna thank George and Lisa for all the time that they have devoted to public art in this city. And we hope to continue to, um, to work with them in the future and to collaborate. Um, and with that, we'll review some in process public art projects. Um, as we continue to expand our commissioning programs, we thought it would be informative for the commissioners and the general public to share current update status for all city commission long-term projects, which is what we're calling, um, what we would have previously called permanent projects, which are projects that are lasting five years or more. This is the first page of our overview of current city-driven long-term public art commissions. We've organized this list by the project phases we use for BAC reviews, which also aligns with the commissioning contract payments, just to give um, a little bit of understanding of how we're moving through these processes. The installation of Width and Web by Matthew Hinsman has begun at the JP branch of the Boston Public Library and Curtis Hall BCYF campus. Uh, I'll be sharing a few more detailed updates on that in a few minutes. Two projects are now in final design phase. You may recall the preliminary design presentation by Joe Wardwell and Nakia Hill in May when they presented a three panel expansion option for their project at the Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library. After collaborating with the library on updating the scope of the project, they are moving forward with a three panel option and plan to present their final design at the November or December public meeting of the BAC. Before that, they'll bring the updated design back to the community through a virtual artist talk and poetry reading at the end of October. We'll share the date and time as soon as it's confirmed. Uh, it should be a very engaging meeting and we hope for a big turnout from the Nubian Square neighborhood especially. Hyde Square is still in engineering and fabrication planning and we hope to have a more detailed update at uh, one of this year's remaining meetings. 
Three projects have moved into preliminary design phase this month. Both commissions for the new Boston Arts Academy have entered preliminary design, as well as the East Boston Police Station project. All the artists and teams are developing their schedules and community engagement plans, so please keep an eye out for updates and invitations for various meetings and reviews. We anticipate formal preliminary design presentations from all three projects early in the new year. Thanks. The artists for Vine Street are still in preliminary design as well. We anticipate a more detailed update for you on both of those projects next month. The DeWitt Playground contract is being executed now and we're looking forward to the official project kickoff and start to community engagement in the next month once the contract is officially approved. We have three projects in artist selection, the Ruggles Corridor Integrated Public Art and the Adams Street branch of the Boston Public Library projects are both in independent review and we look forward to presenting the committee's recommendations in November. The Roxbury branch project, um, the second one, uh, artist selection committee met yesterday and we'll be virtually interviewing finalists in the next week or two. We look forward to bringing those to you in November as well. Finally, we have several calls in development for sites at City Hall Plaza, New Market, and in Roxbury. And we'll share with those with you as they open through the fall. And as promised, here's a more detailed uh, update on With and Web, Matthew Hinsman's project in JP. It was first commissioned in 2017 and will be completed in November of this year. You can see here an artist rendering of the final design. The artwork is comprised of a series of foundation walls and two groupings of cast bronze chairs. The installation will occur in two phases. The first phase of the installation, the construction of the walls, opening of the fence and installation of the footings for the chair groups started last week. On the left, you can see two photos of the first week's work. The top photo is courtesy of the artist and the lower photo courtesy of Noel Torres, director of Curtis Hall BCYF. On the right are four photos, uh, the first cast bronze chair, uh, courtesy of the artist in the foundry, Sincere Metalworks. There will be five chairs altogether and they'll be installed in November in the second phase of the installation. And as you can see, they're just super cool and interesting. Um, I don't know if you remember Matthew's presentation, but it's um, a really fun uh, and um, I think very community um, responsive design. And the detail on the chairs looks great. I know, they're really beautiful. I'm really excited to see them installed. I'd also like to inform the commissioners of a small change in the design based on previously unknown site condition. In this drawing, the red line shows the location of temporary fencing around the artwork location. The gray dotted line shows where an underground gas line is located. Um, the artist is, which is, Unexpected, but um, the artist has been adapting the design. Uh, he's now planning to break what had been a solid wall line to avoid the gas line. Aside from the practical need to keep excavation away from a gas line, uh, Mr. Hintzman noted that the new break, which is four feet uh, in the 30 foot long wall, will further enhance the foundations concept that is the basis for the artwork and will make the design more interesting. So he's rolling with it. Um, and I don't think we need a new design review on this, but I did wanna make sure that you were updated on that. Okay, now we'll go over um, some short-term projects, which are projects that are up for 18 months or fewer. Um, and with that, we'll just kick off, just letting you know about Paintbox. Um, single artist public art guidelines have been approved for artists working during COVID-19. Paintbox has been a great program for artists to be able to work that way with social distance. They're still being completed from 2019, 35 from then, and 2020 Paintbox projects. Um, there are 26 new or replacement designs and artists have been notified and have begun painting. This project received a transformative public art grant this year, projecting our stories, projecting our future. You rem may remember that um, a few years ago, Georgie Friedman, when she was in the first artist in residency program, she set up a, um, a shed in the, in the parking lot of the Strand and did projections onto it. So, DS4SI thought it would be great to um, make use of that structure and they um, applied through Lori Lobenstein, put out a call for a collection of short digital artworks and then have been projecting them on the Strand Theater over the course of two weekends in September and October. And we can see some of those images coming up here. On the left, you can see a flyer for the project, including a list of the many artists whose work was included 
and on, on which weekend they, they were exhibited. At the right is one of the projections from the first weekend. And these images are all from the first weekend of projecting our stories. And these images are from the second weekend, uh, projecting our future. The team at the Strand Theater was instrumental in the success of this work, and we uh, really do want to thank them for their support on this project, as well as all the artists in DS4SI for uh, bringing this project forward. We have an update on another Upham's Corner project as well, uh, Augment by Nick Cave, a short-term project located in Upham's Corner. Um, you might remember was um, um, led by Now and There. Uh, it was commissioned by Now and There and created in partnership with a number of local organizations and artists. Augment by Nick Cave is a three-phase project consisting of an exhibition last summer, followed by a parade and a short-term installation in an interactive commercial building. The artwork was installed last September and was intended to remain for a year. The inflatables, which you can see protruding from the windows, will be removed in October, but the building wrap, which you can see, you know, throughout all the walls there, will remain up indefinitely. And you can, as long as it's in good condition, um, but you can read more about the project and the partners at uh, Now and There's website, which you can also see there at nowandthere.org slash augment. Okay, now we're gonna move on to existing public art. So um, as you know, we've been going through a process of reviewing our artworks. Um, as we work to address racism as a public health crisis in the city, it's important to evaluate the role and impact the city's public art of the city's public art collection. As cultural symbols in public space, public art communicates what we value as a city. Memorials in particular tell the story of who we are and who our heroes are. It is not surprising to see public art become a flashpoint for our communities and we have an opportunity to drive conversation about equity in public art rather than be reactive. In 2018, the BAC commissioned an Opportunity for Change, a report on the national dialogue surrounding monuments and its relevance to Boston's public art collection. That report highlighted six artworks as, as um, priorities for review. And you can see those listed here, the Christopher Columbus statue, Samuel Elliott Morrison, Emancipation Group, the Founders Memorial, the Boston Common Tablet, and the Francis Parkman Memorial. And here you can see um, that while we have begun the work of publicly discussing and planning for the future of two of the artworks that were highlighted in that initial report from 2018, we also recognize that we need to establish phases for reviewing public art for clarity and consistency. On this slide, you'll see a chart establishing review process for all the artworks as a group to support the city's equity goals. In addition to doing this work, um, which as you can uh, read, read here. We, we have other uh, plans to continue conversations, but here you can see that we really do consider uh, policy alignment to be running across all the different steps that we'll take when reviewing artworks. Um, and then just I'll highlight here that we'll, we'll be really focusing on a condition assessment, um, which would include the review of the physical status of the artwork to catalog any known issues and possible repairs, uh, to do research and documentation to, to look at our historical records, legal agreements, and to verify historical facts on ownership and original context. And on out, outreach and education to create digital content, public programming, and coordinate with city departments. And of course, testimony and dialogue to engage stakeholders, historians, public art experts, to receive BAC public testimony through special hearings, as well as at our regular monthly meetings. And, and from there, we would go forward into action steps. So BAC votes and other next steps that may be supported by uh, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture to produce educational materials, interpretation, signage, public programs, temporary artworks, and obviously uh, contracting for storage and removal when necessary. In addition to these steps for reviewing existing artworks, we'll continue to have conversations with the Budget Office about updating you know, our funding to be able to support community-driven artworks that highlight diverse histories and subjects. We also want to work with educators, community members, historians, and artists to create public programming that supports the review of these artworks and elevates awareness. 
We want to engage artists, educators, and young people in temporary artistic interventions to support public dialogue and imagine alternatives. And we want to work with our colleagues interdepartmentally, especially with the Equity Cabinet, to think about processes going forward for reviewing city-managed cultural symbols, which would include public art, but certainly not be limited to that. And to that end, we are also sharing a preliminary announcement of a special meeting on Indigenous public art and cultural spaces in Boston. The date and the format of uh, the meeting would be uh, yet to announce. To start out, we want to really do some reach out to people with diverse Native perspectives. We want to collaborate in planning uh, with those who have made specific requests to us through public meetings as well. As we've been facilitating conversations on the very complex review of existing public art as cultural symbols on public land, and the desire for new artwork and art forms that honor the experiences and histories of the people of Boston, we want to acknowledge that the conversations around Indigenous histories and cultures demands more time and space. We have begun some of these conversations through the panels on confronting co colonial myths in Boston's public space, organized by artists in residence Erin Genia and with other artists and cultural workers. It is apparent that the conversations must not simply be responsive to the artworks we've been reviewing, but should be open and creative. And with that, we have um, some updates on Emancipation Group. The, Hi, um, do you want me to begin now or do you have any introduction to it? I'll just give a brief introduction and then I'll pass off to you. Okay. The, the Art Commission voted, as, as you may know, unanimously to remove the bronze figurative elements of Emancipation Group pending engagement of an art conservator to recommend how the bronze statue is removed and supervise its removal and placement into temporary storage. Document the artwork into the Boston Art Commission archives, which will include photography of the statue on site, drawings, and a 3D scan, as well as the history of the piece and the process that the Boston Art Commission took in order to make this decision. The Art Commission has thus far received two applications from qualified conservators. Both conservators submitted full applications that met the criteria uh, of the vote and bid application. We're awaiting more bids in order to be able to award a contract. We expect the contract to be finalized shortly and that work will commence by November 2020. And um, with that, I will um, pass it off to the emancipation um, subcommittee groups. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, Karen. Um, we had our first meeting of the recontextualization subcommittee meeting on September 25th. Members present were Nikki Green, Greg Gaylor, uh, Kira Singleton, Kim Pinder, uh, who is a new commissioner now, Byron Russian, Marita Rivero, and myself. Uh, Karen Goodfellow opened the meeting by giving an historic overview of the Emancipation Group and what led to the Boston Art Commission voting the removal of the Emancipation Group monument. So I really thank you, Karen, for that. It was a great way to start our, uh, our first meeting. Thank you, Tricia, for uh, making that happen also. Uh, then discussions uh, led to the possibilities of new sites. It was recommended that public land not be used uh, for a new site. It was recommended and suggested that museums, libraries, educational institutions, et cetera, should be considered. Uh, discussions then led to the possibility of what happens to the land after the monument's removal. Uh, should it be a new monument going up? Should it be just open spaces for concerts, etc.? Our next subcommittee meeting will be held on October 23rd. Uh, committee members have been asked to bring proposals to new site suggestions for the meeting. Uh, so uh, that ends my report. Thank you again, Karen. So um, hello everyone and thank you, Karen. I'm gonna give a brief report on the Emancipation Group event subcommittee, which consists of myself and Camilo Alvarez. Uh, we basically had a brainstorming session about what we might like to see as both an educational and celebratory event for the movement of the Emancipation Group. And we decided that we would like to possibly do two to three uh, online events with uh, guest speakers um, and we would like to include a youth team curated event as one of the ones that we would do 
And then, um, so the first would be when the sculpture is created. Uh, the second would be when the sculpture is removed. And the third could potentially be when the place, uh, when the piece finds a new home. We made a list of some of the uh, speakers that we might like to have and we're open to suggestions from other commissioners and from the public. Um, you can always write to us. And um, we also considered including other art forms, for instance, um, composition by local musicians or dance as part of the celebration. So as of this moment, we haven't expanded the group but we do have some folks on our list to invite to participate with us to plan these events. And we'll be reporting more at our next meeting. Thank you. And with that, we'll move on to updates on the Christopher Columbus statue. Uh, this slide describes the ways which we have received uh, thus far public testimony following the vandalism and removal of the statue from Christopher Columbus Park uh, at the waterfront. And we are expecting more public testimony today and we have time for that on our agenda. Uh, during the August and September meetings, we heard verbal testimony from 17 individuals. The BAC continues to receive written testimony regarding Christopher Columbus statue. To date, we've received 124 emails or form submissions from the public, all of which have been shared with the commissioners. Um, you can see the, the way we take in public testimony. If someone would um, like to um, contribute more, all written testimony to the BAC can be submitted to our Google form. You can see a screenshot of it on the right side of your screen. You can access this form on the BAC website. Link to the bottom on the screen or on the publicly posted agenda. If you have trouble accessing the form, you can send written testimony to BAC at boston.gov. As we discussed at our last meeting, we have received two conservation reports for the Christopher Columbus statue regarding the current condition and durability of the statue. According to both reports, conservators could attempt to restore the head and neck area to original appearance, but their repairs would be visible. In terms of preventing future damage, the structural integrity of the artwork cannot be improved as a means of mitigating future damage. There are no known materials that can strengthen stone to make it more impervious or structurally sound. Internal structural reinforcements, such as a longer pin in the head and neck could provide more resistance to the removal of the head. However, if significant force um, is used on the larger pin, it could result in even more damage to the surrounding stone and the small, than the smaller pin. Also coating the marble in a barrier solution will prevent the absorption of paint and other substances. However, coatings will need to be renewed on a regular basis to remain effective um, and a more permanent coating would change the appearance of the marble as well. And um, based, on, based on these findings, we, um, in listening to and reading public testimony, it's clear to us uh, at the staff level that the statue of Christopher Columbus has personal meaning beyond its direct representation. There is an experience of North and residents that connects to the statue as more than a historic figure and certainly more than an artwork or a statue. Um, there's experience rooted in um, being Italian American immigrants and coming to this country and really, you know, choosing a symbol to represent that experience um, of North and Italian American immigrants and especially to um, speak to a time when they experience discrimination. Nonetheless, this uh, statue was installed um, in 1979 and according to Boston Art Commission minutes from shortly after its installation, the statue was never reviewed at a BAC meeting or accepted to the BAC's care or ownership. The statue's current physical status does not meet basic requirements of durability for recommendation to be part of the public collection and or placed on public land. We um, do recommend that the commission takes into account that cultural meaning changes over time that artworks have different meanings to different people, uh, both symbolic and experiential, and the lived experience is more and more becoming part of the conversations we're having around the artworks um, that we review when we consider their, them as cultural symbols in public space. And I'll now share the recommendations that we shared internally with the mayor's office two weeks um, ago on the statue. Uh, the repairs and replacement uh, to an exterior public location are not recommended by um, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture based on the conservators' reports, as we just went over. 
because of the damage to the artwork, we don't believe the statue has the durability to withstand any possible further attacks or, or simply to be in um, an exterior public space for an extended period of time. Uh, instead, we recommend transferal to storage or a private interior location where it can be interpreted and removed from risk of further damage. The city has received written interest from private parties who were original funders, and we defer to city corporation council to determine the proper custody. Um, and we don't believe it is the purview of this commission uh, since the artwork was never accepted as part of our formal collection. So in that way, we do believe it is up to the art commission whether an artwork can be on city of Boston property, but since it's not part of our collection, we do think that should be deferred to corporation council. Um, additionally, we would recommend that the existing pedestal be kept um, on site. Um, that is up to the parks department, but we would recommend also that interpretation and signage be added. So for, for next steps, um, the Art Commission will listen to verbal public testimony today um, and we'll have special meetings to discuss the complex review of cultural symbols on public land and the desire for artworks that honor the experience and histories of the people of Boston. Determined by our initial review in 2018 and our first meeting on June 8th, there is a lack of representation of um, many, many stories. Sorry. Uh, of in our public artwork, and it's apparent that you know we must really um, move forward with that, not only by examining existing artworks, by commissioning new artworks. And so we'd also recommend that we work on new artworks in collaboration with the North End and Italian American communities in approximate site, and also commission new artwork with indigenous communities at a site to be determined. Um, as we said, many histories remain completely untold despite ongoing efforts, and I think both of these stories um, deserve to be told and should not be in any way in competition with each other. African Americans, women, indigenous peoples, local activists, LGBTQIA figures, and many others are still missing from the commemorative landscape in our public spaces and have been missing for centuries. And we hope with these next steps, we can start to, um, start to at least have discussion and actions toward amending that. Okay, and now I will pass it back to you, Mark Inikwa. Okay, thank you, Karen. I know this has been a complex uh, project to review for staff. Um, we appreciate all the hard work you've been putting in. We'll now move on to items on the general uh, on the agenda for review, public testimony, and commission vote. You will notice at the bottom of the screen there are instructions for testimony, which Karen Goodfellow will go over briefly now. Thank you. So um, I'll briefly go over the process for procedure for public comment. Um, following each presentation generally, um, you will have the opportunity to ask questions and make comments. And this is a time to do that regarding the Christopher Columbus statue specifically. So uh, you can comment in a few different ways. In the Zoom platform, you can press the raise your hand icon to and tell us um, using the chat function that you would like to speak. And by phone, you can also press star nine. If no one um, is in line yet, we'll wait two minutes to gather questions and comments, and we'll put you in a digital line. And when it is your turn, uh, we'll announce your name and you can unmute yourself. We do ask that you uh, aim for this, but I think the chair and vice chair are taking comments for two to three minutes today, and they will um, let you know, we'll let you know when you have met your time limit. On the screen, you'll see some visuals and how to participate via the Zoom platform on this next screen. Um, we do understand that it may look different um, depending on the, the system that you're working on, but you can have some sort of how to access it through going to the raise hand button at the bottom of the participants list. So next slide. Hi there. So I wanna offer some helpful guidelines for public testimony. Um, in order to make the most of your two minutes, it's great to um, please prepare ahead if you wanna offer verbal testimony. And here are some guidelines. 
please plan to speak for no more than two to three minutes. The time of the testimony is at the discretion of the commission. However, we do want everyone to get their points across. We understand that this is a really short amount of time. And if you need to submit a longer testimony, you can submit it written um, to the Boston Art Commission's um, email. If you're called, please state your name, your title, if appropriate, program or organization. We recommend that you begin with a clear statement of your position. For instance, I support X um, agenda item and use factual arguments and data to support your position or, um, which I think is really powerful, a personal story or experience to humanize the impact the vote would have. Make sure the topic you wish to testify about is within the purview of the BAC. We ask that you not include violent, pejorative, ableist, or otherwise abusive language. While you may disagree with other attendees' testimony, you may not interrupt them during their allotted time or harass the commissioners or staff. This time is reserved for testimony. The commission may not have time to answer all questions, and you can send those questions to bac at boston.gov. This time is a time for all of us to learn and hear each other's voices, and we, uh, as commission, really, really look forward to this testimony. Thank you, Aqua. Uh, members of the public will now have an opportunity to ask questions and provide public comments on applications uh, and discussions. In particular, we're looking at the Christopher Columbus um, statue. Um, so I believe we're going to have a list. Is that correct? Will we have a list on the screen, Karen? Yeah. Yes, we will. So we'll give people a minute to um, express their interest in participating. I see we have seven hands raised. Uh, and then we'll go through the list uh, person by person. Again, two to three minutes. Uh, we'll ask you to hold your time. Uh, we will interrupt you if you exceed your time limits. Um, so I will begin. Actually, is it possible to zoom in? I, I'm having trouble reading. OK. Uh, Diane Modica, you're the first speaker. So if you can unmute yourself, um, and then you have two to three minutes uh, to present. Thank you. Diane, are you there? We can't, we can't hear you if you're there. Could somebody who has control unmute her? I think she's having trouble with the mute. Yes, I, um, Chair, I just asked her to unmute. Okay. I remember she had trouble at an earlier meeting, so she may still be having the same technical glitch. Diane, we can come back to you, um, but we'll move to the next uh, person, Jean-Luc Parit. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Jean-Luc Parit. I'm president of the board of directors at the North American Indian Center of Boston. And um, we, uh, NACOB does oppose uh, the maintenance and public display of the statue of Christopher Columbus and, and the pedestal uh, itself. Um, and I just wanted to also state that I, pursuant to an executive order by Governor Dukakis, number 126, uh, dated 1976, we are, uh, NACOP is the liaison between the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and residents who are members of tribes uh, currently outside of the borders of uh, Massachusetts. And it is with that uh, that I'm presenting uh, the Boston Arts Commission with this community resolution signed uh, by the political and spiritual leadership of the Taino Nation of Puerto Rico. Uh, Taino opposition to uh, the, public, the public display of Columbus statues in which they cite, uh, among many things, uh, hunting by dogs, mass rape of adults and children, mass hangings, mass decapitations, mass impalement, forced drownings, forced suicides, forced starvation, all manner of dismemberments, and smashing of infant children's heads against the rocks. Um, so I will be forwarding that for a uh, four page resolution to uh, Boston Arts Commission. I will uh, urge uh, this commission to take uh, that resolution into account as an act of a, an indigenous government and consider uh, the uh, city of Boston's relationship, not only between its uh, community members, but also externally 
uh, in government to government relationships with indigenous nations. I also, uh, as, a, as a private uh, taxpaying citizen of the city of Boston, I personally oppose uh, the public display of both the statue and, uh, and the pedestal. And I do recommend uh, that it be taken back to where the agent of Wake Up America Incorporated had, uh, had offices, and that would be at 33 Clough Road, Dedham, Massachusetts, 02026. Uh, the statue, neither the statue nor the pedestal have any place in the city of Boston, and I urge this commission to take into account the opinions of indigenous nations. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and for your comments. I believe I'm unmuted. Okay, and you're available. Great. Thank you. You're next, then. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. As you know, um, as a representative of the Sons of Italy Commission on Social Justice, we have been in attendance at every, he at every hearing since August. And um, I'm sorry, trying to, and that phone will have to ring. Uh, in any event, I have several comments to make. Um, number one is that on the one hand, you're saying you have no jurisdiction over the statue, and yet um, the previous speaker, who I know has been very involved with the Boston Arts Commission, continues to persist in his uh, in maligning, if you will, of Christopher Columbus, as well as the Italian American um, uh, peoples. And I really, really want to know what your commission is going to do, because in effect, I have, at, in every testimony that I have made or written testimony I've submitted, I, had, I have asked you for equal time for stakeholders, which Italian Americans are in this situation, because we continue to get maligned. Uh, and I think it's totally unfair. Now you have these hearings coming up on you know, indigenous peoples, which again, we have said for the record, we have no fight with indigenous peoples. We understand where they're coming from. We understand the, the uh, egregious um, actions by the American government against them over gay hundred years or more. But at the same time, you know, we believe that you know, our position in society has been earned. So my question to you is, do you or do you not have just jurisdiction? What do you plan on doing on allowing us an opportunity to be heard and to really counter act, provide a counter narrative to all of this maligning of Italian American people? I mean, that's a question to the commission. Um, thank you for your question and comment. I'll just say that um, this is the opportunity for um, conversation and that's why we're taking testimony from um, all members of the public. <clears throat> so uh, thank you. Also no, for your comments. Mr. Um, Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I want to know what you have done with the testimony that I have filed with you referencing other uh, original sources of information on the true story of Columbus. I do not hear it being repeated at your hearings. I do not hear any of the commissioners, you know, basically providing it as a reference. All I hear is testimony from the likes of the prior speaker and others, as well as information that I have obtained through Freedom of Information Act that shows interaction between him and other people in the indigenous, indigenous groups between uh, them and the commission. At no time have you guys reached out and asked us to come in for a meeting, to sit with you, or to give us an opportunity to be heard at a public meeting. Um, I believe you're being heard right now. And uh, the other, uh, to your other point, your, your statements have been, and all public statements have been shared with every member of the commission. So uh, every member of the commission has had access to the, your statement, which I read again today. It's the second time I've read it. Um, and I believe other commissioners have done the same. Well, so thank, you, thank you, Diane, for your comments. For your silence is to be taken as agreement with the uh, indigenous. So we need to move on now yep. to the next speaker. Uh, Laurie Stivaletti, are you with us? Hello? Hi there. Hi, uh, you do hear me. Well, um, I just wanna correct the spelling of my name. Um, it actually is on the statue, uh, my grandfather's name and our family. Uh, the spelling of Stivaletta is S-T-I-V-A-L-E-T-T-A. Thank you. Um, thank you for or letting me um, 
or giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Laurie Stivaletta Walsh. I reside uh, here in Boston. Um, I am for keeping the Christopher Columbus statue where it is on the waterfront. Um, as a granddaughter uh, of an Italian immigrant, my grandfather, Nicholas Stivaletta, came from Italy. He landed at Ellis Island and then settled into Boston. Our family sponsored and supported the dedication of the Christopher Columbus statue on the waterfront park in the city of Boston. I am greatly disappointed that an act of violence on our city could change the fabric of our lives. We are immigrants that Boston so strongly supports. My uncle Arthur Stivaletta and many other supporters, including the actor Bob Hope, understood the value of Christopher Columbus. The Christopher Columbus statue brought to our lives, has been brought to our lives in the Italian immigrant. It has allowed Italian Americans to be accepted in the mainstream and to highlight the impact the Italians had on the formations of the Americas. The Italian Christopher Columbus bridged the new world with the old, and this was one of the most significant impacts points of our civilization. His journey identifies the ending of one chapter and the beginning of the new, just like for many immigrants. Um, the Italian Christopher Columbus, not only did he bridge it, but his journey identifies the ending of one chapter and the beginning of the new, as I just stated, and no one since has impacted the Americas in the same way. Christopher Columbus may have been a flawed person and perhaps not a hero in today's standards, but he was not a villain that people today want to make him into. We cannot forget the past or rewrite the history. The Christopher Columbus Park was dedicated during the bicentennial year and the statue commemorates his sea voyage and exploration. It is only fitting that the statue be on the waterfront. Please keep Christopher Columbus statue where it belongs on the waterfront of our city. This is my family story. Before I end this, I do want to just make a comment. Um, I listened to the testimony of the gentleman for uh, the indigenous Indians. And Christopher Columbus never landed on the Americas. He was in the Bahamas. And his fact also states that he was not there during the entire time. So just as all the mass shootings that we have had throughout our country and all the poor families that have dealt with this, I don't believe that President Obama was responsible for those. In this instance, things happened in that time that we can't understand because we were not there. Thank you very much for letting me speak today. Okay, thank you. Um, next uh, speaker will be Bernie Sapienza. Bernie, if you're there, please unmute. Yeah, I'm unmuted, thank you. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, I, uh, I have a, I'm somewhat confused. This segment began with showing us the form that you, that where you can still submit written testimony for or against. Uh, 124 pieces of mail have been received to date. Um, but yet, last Monday, the mayor was in a meeting with uh, some folks from the North End. My understanding is that the, the decision has, a decision has been made regarding the statues. Can you help me connect the dots? Because I'm not sure I'm understanding what we're still talking about. If the mayor, it sounded to me like the mayor had already made a decision. Um, is that a question that um, somebody- Anybody, asked? yeah, anyone in the, on the BAC may be able to, uh, to, to answer that question? Perhaps we can come back to that question. Okay. So, I'll, sorry, I'll speak uh, briefly. I don't know if anyone else would want to join, but the, um, the review of the Art Commission is still necessary for whether or not work is placed on public property. And we have been reviewing the care and custody and the recommendations that I made were also shared with the mayor. And he had his own independent conversations with members of the North End community. I see, so it's not officially a done deal in your opinion at this point as to what's gonna happen moving forward? We've made the same recommendations to the mayor as we've made to the Art Commission that we believe that the artwork does not have the structural integrity to be safely placed on public property. And so we've um, shared that internally with, again, with the mayor's office and we are sharing that 
with the commission and yourselves today. I see. Okay. So then let me ask the commission another question. Then the next question is, is there an opportunity to discuss a new statute? Let's say money was no object. If we were to discuss a new statute and then securing it with security cameras or some other, some other form of security, uh, is that a conversation that takes place with the BAC? Is that part of this? Is that some other conversation down the road? Or if you can just help me connect the dots. I'd like to know what we're using our time to talk about. Uh, I, I think any, you know, we're always open to new artworks um, in the city and those conversations are not what we're talking about today, but okay. it could be another conversation for a future discussion. Okay, so for the have, I, I do want to direct you towards testimony for today, though. Do you have any comments to make? Yeah, yeah the te by, that based on what I just said, then my testimony for today is that uh, if the if your recommendation is indeed, and it's probably accurate that it's not structurally a sound decision to put the statue back, that's cool. Um, then the public testimony I present today is let the North End and other Italian American people discuss the possibilities of a replacement. Christopher Columbus statue with potential security for the new statue, if that be the case, rather than the elimination. So in other words, trying to separate the politics from the physical statue. That's my statement for today. Thank okay. you. Thank you for your comments uh, and questions. Uh, next up, Pierre Belanger. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Equa. Um, and I appreciate also the uh, the updates uh, from uh, Director uh, Karen Goodfellow. My name is Pierre Belanger. Um, I had a nonprofit organization called Open Systems that authored um, a bibliographical guide and archival resource uh, that was titled Confronting Columbus, uh, which was about exposing um, and providing evidence um, of the background history that had never been published before about um, what is the uh, illegitim illegitimate uh, placement of the statue and pedestal um, and the illegitimate renaming uh, of the park, which was originally Waterfront Park uh, in 1974, 1976 by Sasaki, Sasaki and Associates. I speak as a landscape architect and as an urban planner. I have uh, one question and one comment. Uh, the first comment uh, deals specifically uh, with the inseparability of the statue and the pedestal. Uh, the pedestal uh, has a title of a number of uh, so-called sponsors. Uh, it's titled the Friends of Christopher Columbus Committee, uh, which is um, an unregistered uh, committee of one, as we've proven in our letter to the mayor Jul dated July 31st, 2020. Um, there is no committee and there was no public decision-making process. And I believe that the decision of the BAC specifically in the dispense of its decision-making process because in fact it was never proven to be part of um, the inventory of artwork of uh, the city of Boston. Um, to that end, I would argue um, that it is particularly important that the statue and the pedestal be treated uh, together as not being within the purview of the city of Boston property and dispensed of such as an abandoned car or an abandoned house, uh, either through auction, but be placed on private land uh, because public monies are essentially being uh, used for them to date. I'll follow up with a question potentially for Karen, but perhaps Mark or Equa could shed some uh, clarity on this. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, City Corporation Council uh, will be taking care of the decision-making related to the statue. And I would assume that our questions to follow up about maintenance costs or public costs of the statue, consultation costs, maintenance costs should be referred to them, if I can make that assumption. So my question would be, um, who at the City Corporation Council uh, could we approach uh, regarding uh, questions related to those costs? Hi, Pierre, I'll take that. You can, you can send us your request and we'll put you in touch directly. Thank you very much. Okay, Aqua, do you want to take the next? Good. Hi. Okay, thank you, um, Pierre. And next up is Julie. Julie, are you um, with us? Yes, actually, my name is Harry. Oh. My name is um, Harry Johnston. Okay. And I want to thank you for letting me speak. Um, I am a 
North End property owner and a city of Boston taxpayer. And I got to tell you, I, I'm really very upset with the way this whole a aspect of the Christopher Columbus statue has been, has been handled by the city. Um, I totally agree with, I want an answer for Diane Monica's question that she, she asked. That was a perfect question. And I think Bernie has the perfect answer. You know, I, I, although I am not an Italian American, my relatives have come to Ellis Island and we've lived in Boston our whole lives. And I spent a lot of time in the North End and I'm very familiar with that community. That would be no problem to raise a new statue with total funding, forget about the city, total funding from people who live there. You don't have to be Italian American to love Christopher Columbus. His statue is, his statue is beautiful. His story is beautiful. Despite the way it's being told today in today's PC world, he does have a great story. Um, and that park is, is a beautiful park and it needs to be kept Christopher Columbus Park with the statue, not moved. And the most disturbing part to me about the city, and I want an answer from the Arts Council on this, why do you ne negotiate with terrorists? You have people who are thugs that come to that park and rip it apart or burn it or paint it. And what's your answer to them? You reward them. You reward them by letting them do this. And then we're just going to get rid of it. You know what I'm going to tell you is going to happen? You're going to have the same thing happen to the George Washington statue, the Sam Adams statue. If they can do that this easy, boy, I'll tell you, we got a real problem in this city. All you need to do is look, look at Portland, Oregon. Is that the direction that you want this city to go in? Because that's what you're doing by you giving into these terrorists. You don't negotiate with, with, with terrorists, and that's what they are. Bernie had the perfect answer. You rebuild the statue, you put security there, and you have cameras. And if people are caught, something actually happens to them that's amazing. They actually get to pay a penalty. Maybe they go to jail. Then you would have some respect. It's absolutely amazing to me that the city of Boston is just caving in to these terrorists or extortionists. That's exactly what they are. And no one seems to care about this. Because I'm telling you, they're going to come after every other statue in this city. They can see it's done this easily. And it's pretty, pretty, pretty sad. And that statue was very loved by, I'm in the tourist business also. People love that whole park, that statue. There's thousands of people that go there on a nice warm day in the summertime. And it's absolutely ridiculous. We don't need the city's money. We could raise that money ourselves. And like I said, you don't have to be Italian American. Obviously that's the majority of people, but you just be an American and to realize what is going on there and how sad this whole aspect is. And I'd like an answer. I'd like Diane and Monica's question to be answered. That wasn't answered. And I don't know why it isn't. I'm sorry, could you just state the question again? Sure. Diane and Monica, she asked the question. She said about the way, is this statue under, is it, be, is it under the guise of the Arts Commission or is it not? Because it sounded to me like it's not. That's part of the conversation that we're having today. So, okay. so what is your role then? If you are not part of it, why if, can't individual it, citizens build a new statue? And you know, you always talk about diversity and stuff. What about the diversity for Italian Americans who've been there for over 120 years? And specifically, that was the where fishermen went. That's the connection with Columbus. That's the connection with it being on the waterfront. That is exactly why they have the Fisherman's Feast is there, because that's the park where it was. That's why it was put there. And, and people, it's unbelievable to me, you have people who've dedicated thousands of dollars to that statue. You just kick them aside for these extortionists okay, to go Thank you for your comments. Uh, your your okay. time is up. I appreciate thank the time, thank you. And I will just point out that we very recently completed a beautiful work of art in the North End and North Square uh, with the community and that we have a long relationship of working with our local communities uh, throughout the city to develop uh, new artworks. So thank you for your comments. Uh, next up is Nadia DiCarlo. Nadia. Hi there. Thank you for, for the time. I just want to reiterate my initial sentiments that I brought to the commission. Um, that Christopher Columbus was essentially the first immigrant to America and, and as such represents all the immigrants. Not to honor or recognize him goes against the whole immigrant experience. 
Not all historical figures were perfect, but we're not celebrating the individual or his birthday. We're celebrating the whole idea of cultures colliding for better, for worse, and a new people coming to these shores. As, Italian, as an Italian American, and for Italian Americans, Christopher Columbus represents our person for this. And I want to inform the community that a statue for our community placed in a cherished location, Christopher Columbus Park, where we as Italian and Italian Americans, both young and old, regularly gather to celebrate the Italian Republic Day, Festa della Repubblica, to honor our Navy veterans, the few that still are here um, and still put on their, uh, their suits and they come out and we salute them, where we do Italian Flag Day, where we promote the learning of Italian la language to our youth and we have um, uh, things for kids and, and we promote the Italian language with our um, our, our special forces here that do that promote that um, amongst other things. So this is a, a sacred gathering spot for Italians and our statue is there and it's been attacked. And frankly, we want it replaced. I don't really want, I'm not really happy to hear that it's too fragile, it, it can't be put back, we have to stow it away and in some interior space. I feel that the BAC is a talented group artistically I'm sure they can do a stellar job at incorporating the old of the new, a repurposing, or frankly, even a replacement. Yesterday, as a community, we widely celebrated the national federal holiday, and we held open discussions on many platforms with all groups and different viewpoints at the academic level, at the cultural level. We're not saying we have to uh, wage culture wars in the city, but it's only fitting that something that is, represents us and is for us and that was given to us and that was demolished, be replaced. I also second er the earlier speaker sentiments. I really like more color on the plans of the statue being relocated to this interior space of the building. How can we gather as a community on the sacred space that we've gathered for over you know, many decades? Um, you, you as a committee wanna promote the culture of transparency, but we're being served something else. I hope this process is adhered to. I feel that the attack, the process, the process and the backroom deals are just further marginalizing us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nadia, for your comments. Um, I don't feel like backroom deals are a part of what the Art Commission does, but this testimony is, is helpful. Hearing from the citizens of Boston no matter what neighborhood they come from is very, very valuable and we take it very seriously. So thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. And if you wanted me to be a little bit more clear, it was kind of told to us what Bernie had highlighted earlier that it was going to be put in some interior space in a development um, and it was gonna be held there, but as a replacement or a repurposing or, you know, a, a, I'm not sure if you know about this quote unquote deal, um, we, we don't have any clarity on it. Um, and we're just hoping that the BAC process is still the process um, because we just don't want it hidden away. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, move on to Richard Vita. Richard Vita. All right, um, let's move on to Reverend Joe Rocha and we can move Richard to the end in case he returns. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, uh, Reverend Joe. Are you there? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you, Equa. I thank you, Mark, for this time. I got this information uh, late, so I, I wrote down a few notes, and if you could mind, if you would mind just let me to speak them, that would be fine. Um, again, my name is Reverend Joseph Rocha, and I'm with the New Democracy Coalition. We've been campaigning, petitioning the city of Boston, um, City Hall, and the mayor to change the name of Faneuil Hall. If you do not know, Faneuil Hall was named after Peter Faneuil, and his uncle Andrew Faneuil um, not only owned slaves, but they sold slaves, amen? And um, on the selling of a slave boy 
some of the profits that were there were able to purchase this building and then they turned it over to the city of Boston. But in the interim, before Peter uh, passed away, he willed to his sister his uh, five slaves or so. So that perpetuated the um, institution of slavery. And what I come to say is, what is the uh, Boston Arts Commission stand on this? And if you just let me say a few more things. Amid a long overdue national conversation that makes uh, about names and monuments as a result of racial injustice, public institutions are being asked to reckon with their racist roots, tinged with the history of imperialism and violence. Treating humans as property, the names of people who advocated for a system of forced labor and violent oppression. Their ubiquity negating the hours that black people, indigenous people, and other people of color have experienced in this country. They perpetuated white supremacy. Uh, celebrating a slave owner is contradictory to the community of diversity and inclusion we force it. We don't feel like that represents our community anymore. Uh, this erased history uh, narrative is a false history, okay? Um, you cannot stop looking at these issues seriously rather than focus on cosmetic changes designed to appease people. Name changes can and should play a role in the racial justice movement. You cannot imagine an anti-racist future with the names of slave owners, slave profiters on our public buildings and in public squares. The question is why not now? Our vestiges of a time when it was both legal and socially acceptable to own human beings, um, is that going to be our, our pathway to, to reconciliation? We are passively accepting and mentally sanitizing all of brutality that came with owning enslaved people, branding chains, forcing people to do backbreaking labor, punishing them for running away, the slave patrols that form the roots of today's police departments. By working to change them, we are actively seeking to build a more just and equitable world. So what we're saying is that if we're going to deal with this, this, this racism that, that persists, whether it be in the, in the Atlantic American community or the black community or the indigenous Native American community, we've got to come, come together and sit down. I would say for the Native Americans and the Italians, why don't they sit down and talk about the issues and see if they can resolve it? I mean, that would be the thing to do. And in regards to Peter Faneuil, we need to petition, we need to have a hearing at City Hall and with the mayor. The mayor has already said he wants to have a dialogue, but we haven't had that since then. So I just was calling to bring that forth to the commission and also to find out what your stand is on this issue about renaming Faneuil Hall. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Reverend Joe. T today's testimony is, is connected to the Christopher Columbus statue. Oh, and yes. um, that would be something that uh, we probably would not be discussing name changes of places on the Boston. I just clarify one, one thing too. Also, uh, name changes of Faneuil Hall would not fall under the jurisdiction of our commission. Exactly. Uh, just, so, just so you're aware um, that that's not something that we have involvement with. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Uh, next, let's see if Richard Vita can, is, is he available now? Hello. Yeah. Hi. Yes, we can hear you now. All right. So you thank to... you. So I, I want to make uh, make two points. The first one is is over the process of these meetings. Um, I'm the president of October Italian Heritage Month. I'm on the Commission for Social Justice. I live in the North End. Uh, I'm a member of other Italian organizations. Uh, I want to say this. Uh, the attempt by the commission to afford uh, public meetings where people uh, can be fairly heard has, is really totally inadequate. It's a good faith attempt. We, we've We've tried, I know Diane Modica, who I work with, with regard to presenting these materials, 
tried to get uh, inputs and conversations about the process um, of these proceedings before the commission. Um, but the allowance of, of two minutes um, is not sufficient for any one presenter to make, make the necessary points. And also, um, Mr. Chairman, the, the failure of the commission to, uh, to hold the speakers to talk and present claims that can be proven and justified with fact. So to say it differently, to make claims that are patently unprovable of genocide and white supremacy and, and claims of that alike without a single question or, or opposition or caution to the speaker is, it, it, it just shows the process is not capable of arriving at the truth of what is being talked about rather than just having, whether you um, incorrectly call it a First Amendment right, let them say anything and everything they want and just use up their two minutes and leave it to your you know, good wishes to, to arrive at the right decision. So, uh, you know, I, I do believe that there's a need to have somebody act as a moderator to check the, the vitriolic speech. And, and so the second point I want to make before I get to the, the, the mayor's comments, the, the, uh, the second point I wanna make is that the process needs to be defined. We've had two public meetings. The second meeting, because we're always except for this one at the end of the agenda, um, we never even got to what the process was to be going forward. It was on the agenda, repeated attempts to try to get some clarification of what was meant by just the generic line item was met with, with no, no reply, uh, no answer. And so um, I do believe that there needs to be a, a better way to fully air these here. Now, I'm going to read because it, it sounds like most of those that have spoken or on the commission are, were not aware, but I was on the Zoom call uh, with the meeting that the mayor spoke on Monday, October 5th. And I'm going to read some excerpts to you quickly. Mayor Marty Walsh announced on Monday evening at the North End Waterfront Neighborhood Council that the fragile condition of the statute at its recent beheading by vandals means it will not be returning to the pedestal in Christopher Columbus Park. Instead, the Boston Arts Commission will begin a process to design and construct a new statute recognizing Italian immigrants to be placed on the pedestal. The existing statue will be repaired and placed at the North End chapter of the Knights of Columbus, where it will be publicly displayed. Additionally, wow. he stated that the Boston Arts Commission will be appointing an advisory group of North End restaurant, uh, uh, residents to, to this commission in order uh, to uh, make recommendations and to make next decisions regarding this new new Italian immigrant statute. So, you know, my position is I have to ask you to wrap up your statement yeah. now. You're beyond time. So I I will the Boston Arts Commission to clarify where it is in all of this here and to to put in the records of the commission, uh, if, it, if that statute is not to be returned, then there'll be this process of coming up with an appropriate Italian heritage statute 
uh, and to appoint an advisory group of North End residents. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Brett Roman. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Brett Roman, President of the North End Waterfront Neighborhood Council. Um, I did want to uh, confirm Richard's comments before about what the mayor, um, the mayor's comments at our meeting last Monday night, uh, confirming that there would be a process going forward that the statue was not deemed safe and going to um, a different location at this time and that there would be a community process based on um, discussions with the neighborhood of what, if any, new statue would go forward. Um, proposals such as um, if there's an Italian immigrant family or if there's a new statue or a new design or new concept that is proposed by the neighborhood or proposed by the residents of the North End. Um, I just wanted to confirm and, and see if I can get answers to um, how that process would take place going forward if there were to be a new statue or a new uh, memorial um, dedicated to, the, um, to replace the Columbus statue or perhaps a new Columbus statue. Um, how would that process proceed going forward? And um, just so I may speak uh, independently uh, from the council, I do want to say that I do think that the, uh, the precedent set, the, the precedent set, set that allows vandals to um, deface any statue, regardless of this one in particular, um, due to whatever reasons they so deem fit, um, how that would have an impact on statues across the city going forward, and not just this one in particular, but how vandals can deface and, and make a statue irreparable to the point that it has to be removed from its location and just the precedent that would be set with that. Um, so if you could just answer a question about what the process would look like going forward for um, this community process and it, would the be with the Boston Arts Commission be meeting with New Nick or NURA um, to carry out conversations about what would possibly replace the Columbus statue, if anything's replacing it at all. Um, thank you for your comments. I don't know if Perhaps arts and culture would want to say something, but generally, and I'm, I don't know specifics about what you're talking about, but generally we go through a community process. We have a, a series of uh, ways in which new artworks can come into the city. Um, and those are all laid out in our, um, in our documentation. Um, you know, it's a process where we engage with the community like we did with the North End on the um, uh, North, North Square process, uh, which is actually in addition uh, focused on immigration stories as well. Um, so whenever we have a process with any community, um, we work hand in hand with that community to develop a work that's appropriate to the site. And Mark, just to um, back up what you're saying, this, this concept of commissioning another artwork focused on Italian American heritage in the North End and in Boston is part of the recommendations that Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture put forward. Um, and what we were describing in terms of community process is the art commission process, just like you've talked about it. So anything that the city would commission would have that um, community input and many, many opportunities for feedback on the process and through artist selection and um, just like all of our other projects do. Perfect, if I may just, if I just add for clarification, would, would that entail um, the like uh, exclusive meeting with the North End Waterfront uh, Neighborhood Council or the North End Waterfront Residents Association solely with the BAC to discuss designs and future concepts? We generally hold public meetings and we take um, cues from our colleagues at the city. So we often work with the Office of Neighborhood Services. So in this case, we would work with John Romano and he would help us reach out. And then we would also publicly, um, publicly notice a meeting and invite people, anyone who wanted to, you know, from the neighborhood to come to attend would be welcome, but we will um, do our best to make those contexts and um, thank you for your recommendations. Thank you. Okay, our final speaker, Marissa uh, Babin, Babin. Sorry if I got it wrong. Marissa, can you unmute yourself? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right, hi. Um, so my name is Marissa Babin. Um, I have never attended one of these meetings before or um, given public testimony about anything before, but I have been following closely in the news everything that's been happening with the Christopher Columbus statue. Um, and I feel very, very strongly um, that the act of vandalism against the statue back in June was 
very, very wrong and unjust. And um, I feel very strongly um, that this act of vandalism should not be allowed to decide what happens to the statue. And I just wanted to share my opinions and my concerns about this. Um, I'm just a private citizen, but I work in Boston and every day during my lunch break, I would take a walk and I would pass through Christopher Columbus Park and I would walk past that statue. And I have always really, really loved the statue. I think it's a very beautiful statue. Um, and as someone who is half Italian American, I found that statue personally meaningful to me. So learning that the statue had been so brutally and barbarically beheaded really, really made me personally outraged and upset. Um, and I understand the explanation that structurally the statue can't be displayed in the same place anymore due to the damage that unfortunately was done to it. Um, but I just wanted to um, weigh in in favor of the idea of commissioning a new statue of Christopher Columbus. Um, I feel that that is the best option um, because just allowing a vandal to get to decide what happens to the statue really, really strikes me as wrong. Um, I understand from a practical point of view, it might not be feasible to put the same statue back up for display. And I did hear about Mayor Walsh's um, plan to relocate the statue to a, um, a portable housing development built by the Knights of Columbus. And I think if, if that particular statue can't be displayed in the park anymore, I do think that that's a good idea. But I think ideally it would be great commission a new statue of Christopher Columbus to put back in the park. Um, I feel that without a statue of Christopher Columbus there, the park is just not the same. And again, I find, I just find it disturbing that whichever person decided to behead the statue is essentially going to be rewarded if the statue was taken down and not replaced. So I do think building a new statue of Christopher Columbus and ideally adding security cameras to deter anyone from doing an act of vandalism like this ever again is the best option. Um, I also just wanted to state, I understand that no historical figure is perfect because no person is perfect and that includes Christopher Columbus but I find the trend that's been happening these days of eliminating any statue or monument to a historical figure who is not approved of by the politically correct attitudes of today. I find that to be a very disturbing trend. I think a person does not need to be perfect in order to have a great story, in order to be admirable, and in order to have their statue continue to exist in the city of Boston. Um, I feel that- Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for your comments and uh, thank you for making comments for the first time. We appreciate um, that you uh, put yourself out there in uh, the public realm. Thanks for participating. Um, one more speaker has signed on, Phil Celeste. We, Phil actually had a thumbs up, so I, I don't know if you comment. Know okay, I see the comment. Right. I see other comments in the, the line. I'd like now to move um, to commissioner discussion. Um, so we'll end the period of um, public comments and testimony and move to commissioner discussion. And perhaps, Karen, could you um, refresh our discussion of the recommendations that you have made? Um, oh. Sure. Um, let me pull and there may up. be some questions from commissioners uh, and others. Sure. I will um, just as I'm pulling up my my um, my slides for my own reference again, uh, remind everyone here that the Art Commission's purview does uh, require them to review any artwork that would be placed on public property, um, and also to vote on whether an artwork would become part of the City of Boston's art collection. So in that way, we review temporary installations, which 
may be loaned to the city um, temporarily or, or just placed for a period of time. Um, so in this way, it, it is still under the our commission's purview to um, consider whether uh, the statue would go back to City of Austin property, even if it is not part of our collection. Um, and so for the recommendations, just to go over again, um, our recommendations were um, that the repairs um, and the replacement to an exterior public location are not recommended um, based on the conservatives reports, which we shared uh, last month and again today. Uh, we do recommend the transferal to storage or a private interior location where it can be interpreted and removed from risk of further damage. Uh, we defer to city corporation council to determine the proper custody. Uh, we mentioned that there, you know, there has been a letter sent into uh, the city to the mayor's office um, expressing um, interest in the statue. As it is not part of our collection, we would defer to them to um, see the right way. And I know there have been public conversations with the mayor and residents in the North End about that. But again, that is not under our purview. Um, and we lastly, we do recommend that the pedestal is kept in place, although that is up to the Parks Department. We are just looking at this statue at this time and that interpretive signage be added. Uh, and we are additionally are recommending the commissioning of new artworks. And I think that's really important to remember here um, to, specifically, to specifically, although we would really recommend that um, many new artworks um, are created uh, in the near future. And you see, if you were here for the beginning of the meeting, um, many of those that we are working on across the city and all the neighborhoods now. But specifically, we recommend the commissioning of a new artwork in collaboration with the North End and Italian American communities in a proximate site. And we also recommend a new artwork within uh, to be developed working with indigenous communities in a site to be determined. Okay, thank you, Karen. So I think we could open it up Maybe we could go back to that slide where your recommendations are printed so that in case there's any questions from commissioners on those recommendations. The recommendation for the new artworks is on a separate slide. So if you wanted us to move forward. Oh, okay. No, that's, that's okay. We understand that there's potential for two new artworks in the future. And I would just add, maybe add to this again for context that part of what has made the because people mentioned in their testimony some confusion over the process, which I definitely hear the um, the thing that has made this um, more circuitous just within what falls to the art commission or not is the ownership question. So since this wasn't voted on into the city collection. Um, when it was installed, that's where it's been trickier for us to figure out exactly what each step of the process should be. So it seems clear to us that there, you know, it's under the BAC's purview, like Karen said, to vote on things coming to public land, including the statue coming back to public land. But in terms of what to do with it outside of that, we feel like that falls outside of the purview of the BAC. So just to reiterate that, because it's a, it, it isn't a very straightforward um, process. Can you can you explain what the term interpretive signage means and approximate site? Sorry, means actually, we're not in we're not in public comment time. I'm sorry, but uh, I will just say that you could add, add a chat if there's a question like that. So, commissioners, comments, questions. Deliberation. Did have just a question actually about interpretive signage. Is that a process that's usually pursued by the staff? Uh, yes, generally we work with artists when an artwork is being created. Um, I think going forward um, with the collection, we'll want to take a broader approach in interpreting artwork. So we had talked about uh, the report from 2018 that highlighted six artworks that we um, should have under review. Um, many of the interpretation um, recommendations um, were many recommendations for interpretation were made in looking at those. So, um, with something like with this um, conversation with the emancipation group, um, there was consideration for whether or not is this the right artwork to be in public space. But for many of them, we thought that interpretation and signage would be um, a way to add context 
um, to, to pose questions to the public as they view the artworks um, the way you would see in a museum. And so we would start by looking at those, but really wanna think more broadly about how we're um, creating dialogue around artworks, both on site and online. Thank you. Other questions from commissioners or comments? I just wanted to say a couple of things. I, mean, I, I agree with the recommendations and would vote when asked to vote to uh, agree with them. But I have to say that I'm disappointed of where, why we are where we are with this statute. Looking back at what we did with the emancipation statute and the process that went, we went through with that, where it started with a petition from a group who had uh, concerns about the statute that we heard from them. And um, it was a very deliberative process where we heard and we made a decision and we're working on how to, how to um, remove that statue and what to, to do with it afterwards. Um, I have to agree with some of the speakers that it's unfortunate that this, this uh, monument was destroyed essentially was destroyed because we're finding out that it's not rest, really can be put back and be placed on uh, back in its site. Um, I was disturbed by seeing photos in the, uh, this morning's paper about what statues were done in uh, Portland where they basically removed and destroyed the Teddy Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln. Um, so I, I just find it a very disturbing trend um, and I I want to applaud the process that we all did, including the public, about the emancipation statute. I think that was the right way to handle these um, issues. And I would hope that uh, we would learn from this process for this statue that uh, the next ones we're going to be discussing, that people will respect those monuments um, for what they are and at least have a civil dialogue about what to do with them and not to feel that they can destroy the peace in order to have the peace removed. So um, that's just my initial thoughts on this whole piece. Other comments? You know, uh, Michael, I completely agree with you as per the recommendations and also your sentiment. And I mean, I think the beauty of art is that they are each unique works and they're placed in a unique place. And I think we are, have found ourselves in a unique situation. And I think it's always going to be difficult and uh, contrived and it's a process. And I think the fact that we are having these meetings for this process is incredibly essential in order for us to project, you know, what our future holds for us. And I mean, I think the people in any which way, even if it's considered a terrorist or a vandal, it is a form of communication that we all have to take into consideration as it goes. And so I think more uh, conversation, more processes, you know, will kind of attenuate and maybe console some that are grieving for this, you know, statue that was placed in their community. Um, and as far as per our purview, we still have to really find out from city corporation council as to, you know, what we can do to help the situation of this uh, statue that was placed in our custody for a while that we, kind of seem to have not even placed there ourselves. Um, thank you. Um, Michael, I just wanted to respond to your point that we, you know, we did set out those phases that we're looking to follow and that we found in beginning those with this piece that, um, you know, first looking, um, we first started discussing this uh, statue on June 9th um, unfortunately, the statue was vandalized shortly after that, and we've, we had to just take a very different approach than we did with the Emancipation Group, and that we were prompted after that to go into you know, looking at our files and looking at documents, and it was in the minutes that this statue, you know, never did go through our process and so wasn't in our collection. And so we have had to you know, have a very different process, but I do hope going forward that we are able to follow a, a, a different sort of um, conversation. Um, and Additionally, that the the need to to really study this as an as an object did sort of come at the the forefront of our thinking immediately. Though it was not how we had hoped to go forward. Right, and I just want to clarify. I'm not saying that the commission or the commission staff has done anything wrong with this. I just feel that we've been put in this situation because 
or, or, or accelerate is because of what someone did to the piece that didn't respect the piece or respect the process that had begun back in, in June for for this really to be fully discussed and, and, and a, a right decision to be made. I think that was the point I was trying to make. And I apologize if, if it was it came off uh, differently. Thank you, Michael. Um, other commissioners, Robert or Aqua, any comments? Mark, I, I have a comment. Um, uh, this is, is this has been difficult to listen to uh, the many different sides of um, of, uh, of of where and what we should do with this statue. Um, as a new commissioner, I'm kind of one year old. I've, I've sat down with uh, three neighborhood groups, and I, I I would just like to say that we do indeed listen to the neighborhood groups, um, and it's so important to hear from you. And if we do erect a new statue, which I, I think we will on that land, um, that you will have a great deal of input on that. Um, and and that, uh, that, that's a part of what this commission does. And when I think we do it well, um, and I, I don't think that you should leave the meeting thinking that you will have no voice in this. Thank you, Bob. Um, Aqua, any comments from you? I'm not seeing her. Aqua, are you there? I was, I was muted, Mark. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I, I sort of agree with uh, everything that the other commissioners have said. It, this is a sensitive, um, set of circumstances and we are responding anew. We are setting up new systems to make sure that we hear many voices and it's not easy work. Um, we appreciate um, the patience and the understanding and the participation of the folks that are coming to these meetings and saying what they feel and what they think about the process. Um, we don't take it lightly. I'm sure many of us after this meeting is over, we'll still be thinking about uh, what's been said here and how to best respond. Um, and so I would just like for folks to know from all of the communities that are looking at Boston as a place that can be a new representation of all of the histories of its residents that it takes time to make good, beautiful change. And um, I think that all of the commissioners are up to the task, as difficult as it may seem sometimes. And let's just keep going. Let's just keep working on it. Thank you, Aqua. Um, I wanted to give the chance for Brian or John, who are our new commissioners, to make any comments if they'd like. It's very early in your experience. <laughs> Um, I would just um, say that I would be in support of the recommendations that I think um, the staff have been making to the mayor's office. Um, I think those seem like really good next steps at this point. And for me, I just appreciate hearing so much of the public testimony today and previously. Though it is my first day as a commissioner, I have been attending these meetings regularly for the past few months. And I know that these are sensitive subjects to discuss and that to Aqua and Mark and Michael's points and so many other commissions that your input is important to this process. And whatever recommendations we proceed moving forward that your input will be extremely helpful and beneficial to wherever we end up in the future. So thank you all for your participation. And I would, I would echo that. Thank you to everybody who has participated. I know that sometimes there's frustration with the city or with the art commission. Um, we are uh, an independent body. I think there's been some reference to backroom deals. We're an independent um, body that's meant to be set up to ensure that outside voices are reflected and understood and listened to. 
Um, and so uh, I just want to clarify that, you know, in the hundreds of comments that we've been reading over the summer and now uh, this week at, for two of the projects that we've been looking at, two of the sculptures, <clears throat> I've been impressed at how thoughtful and um, insightful many of our citizens are about, and, and I should say passionate about artwork as well. Um, I was just recounting to some of the new commissioners um, uh, independently that um, <clears throat> we're used to having meetings where maybe three or four people show up and now we have meetings where 60 to 160 people show up um, and we really do um, share your passion about artwork in the city. All of us joined to create new artworks, not to remove artworks. Um, that's what we're driven by. Um, and so um, these are very heavy decisions for us as well. Um, and I will add that I I also, like others, agree with the recommendations um, uh, as proposed to us by the, by the staff. <clears throat> I will say uh, one more thing, which it does seem like there may be two sets of recommendations which might be independent of one another. The first is about the Christopher Columbus statue, and the second is about commissioning or beginning a process to commission new artworks. Karen, would you recommend that we take those on as separate votes? Um, or or, yeah, or I mean, you think that's the full recommendation of the, the that's, staff? That's everybody. our full recommendation really um, to sort of um, look at this as an opportunity um, to think not just about taking away, but of really listening. I think to what uh, all the public testimony we've heard is we've heard really a lot of people talk about the meaning of the statues, um, whether they found it harmful or, or you know, personally uh, meaningful about their heritage. I think the recommendations to commission new artwork speaks to that, to what we heard from people about the, the meaning of the artwork and um, that we are not just simply looking to remove artworks, uh, but to really listen to people for what they would like to see up in their public space. I'd like to say one more thing, um, and this has come up many times in the testimony about the vandalism. I, I think I can speak for all of the commissioners. We, we do not support vandalizing public art as a means to an end. And it's unfortunate, as Michael said, that that is what brings us to kind of this state. I mean, we were in a direction where we were looking at different pieces, but the fact that this, uh, this public piece was brutalized is not something that we support is not something that makes us more inclined to go in a particular direction. And um, moving forward, I hope that we don't see that kind of behavior in the city of Boston again. I'm speaking for myself, but I feel like the rest of the commission would probably agree with me that that's not how we wanna resolve uh, issues around monuments and public art in the city of Boston. So for everyone that spoke to that, uh, please know uh, we agree with you that vandalism is wrong um, and we don't support it at all, ever. Okay, so uh, we're at a point where we could consider a motion. Um, uh, does somebody want to make a motion to accept the recommendations of the staff as outlined in this, in this meeting? I have a question. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's late to ask this question about the pedestal because I don't feel that I've actually seen the pedestal as a separate entity. I know there are names on it that someone mentioned earlier, but uh, then someone else said that the pieces kind of go together. And so um, I'm wondering if, if that is a decision that has to be a part of this could we take a look at it? Could we have more information about the pedestal? And if it's kept, does that mean that that will be a space for a new work of art or do we have more options? Uh, that's what I'm wondering about. Karen, can you clarify that a little bit more? Because you, I thought your recommendation was that that becomes part of the, um, that, that Parks determines the future of the pedestal. But okay. Yeah, I, I no. that was the recommendation. Um, the pedestal again has many names on it that are meaningful to the people in the North End neighborhood. And that seems to me um, part of the meaning that we want to honor, um, similar to how we're commissioning a new artwork. Um, 
I understand um, folks who, who feel differently about that. Um, but I would say that we have, you know, we've seen people doing temporary artworks on that pedestal, um, you know, in, in the time since the statue was removed. And we had similarly made the decision to leave the pedestal for emancipation group for flexibility and for the future. And I don't exactly know what plans are for parks redesign or what that conversation would be in the future, but I don't necessarily see it as something that um, would, would need to be removed at this time, but may consider, but may need uh, further consideration. Hey, is that something that you want to? So, yeah, I would say uh, that we might say recommend that the pedestal is kept in place at this time. So that, you know, in the future, it may be moved, it may become a part of something else. I, I don't know, but I'd like to have that flexibility as we go forward. So I, I would be prepared to make a motion that we accept um, the recommendations uh, from the um, BAC staff and the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture on the Christopher Columbus statue with the change that we recommend that the pedestal is kept in place at this time and that interpretive signage is added. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Do I have a second for that? I second it. Okay, um, so I am going to read off um, uh, members of the commission. Um, we have our list, our standard list. Uh, first is Aqua Holmes. Uh, say yes if you agree with the motion that you, you made. Yes. Okay, Michael Canizzo. Yes. Cara Elliott Ortega. Yes. Um, oh, uh, Camilo Alvarez. Yes. Um, Brian Hone. Yes. And John, sorry, John, I don't remember your last name right now. Andres. Andres. Andres, yes, thank you. John, yes. Andres. Yes. Yes. Okay, and I am also a yes on this. So the motion passes. I'm yes, also. Bob. Oh, Bob, sorry, <laughs> I missed you. Uh, my list was in. Uh, so yes, uh, so now we are officially, uh, the motion passes uh, unanimously. Um, and again, we appreciate all the input from so many people on this conversation. I think that this, we hope, will be the beginning of multiple conversations on something new and uh, new artworks um, being brought to a community um, who we all agree uh, deserves to be celebrated. Um, so we look forward to commencing on conversations uh, in those regards in the in the coming months. Uh, the, our last order of business then would be to adjourn. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I move that we. Bob, you broke up a little bit. Oh, he's frozen. Oh. He's already adjourned, perhaps. Did someone else uh, move for adjournment? I move that we adjourn this Boston Art Commission meeting of October 13th, 2020. Okay. Thank you, Camilo. Uh, do I have a second? I second. Okay. Thank you, Brian. All those in favor, uh, I'll read off your names. That hey. was John. That was, that was a John. Oh, sorry. Oh, boy. I can't see you guys. Uh, so, Echo Holmes. Yes, I agree. Michael? Yes. Karen? Oh, sorry, Cara? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Camilo? Yes. John? Yes. Brian? Yes. And Bob? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, and I am a yes as well, so uh, we are now uh, in adjournment. Thank you, everybody who's participated, and thank you to the staff for all the hard work that you've been doing uh, over the last couple of months. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.